It is the first few days of September 2013, and a new building along the London skyline has gained a rather lot of attention, but for all the wrong reasons. It's not for its different than normal skyscraper silhouette or the loss of the 1960s building it replaced, but for its unique quirk, its ability to melt things around it. News reporters have lined the streets reporting on the building's defect. One has even managed to fry an egg just by placing it on the street alongside the tower. Today we're looking at 20 Fenchurch Street, nicknamed the Walkie Talkie, or more humorously, the Fry Scraper. But how did such a potentially dangerous building appear on one of the most iconic skylines in the world? Well, watch to the end to find out. My name is John, and welcome to Plainly Difficult. So before I start, I'm going to have to boast at the fact that I got off my lazy behind and actually made my way up to London. And even more so, I managed to get up to central London on a day that was rather similar to when this event actually happened. Although luckily this time I didn't get melted by a death ray. Anyway, let's get started. Background. London skyline is an ever evolving organism. Due to the space being limited along the central portion of the ancient city, it has seen a trend towards taller buildings. One part of London is no better described like this than the City of London. Now London is a strange place. When I say City of London, I actually mean the City of London, a roughly square mile area which follows the ancient borders of the OG London. Of course, the rest of Greater London is also the London City, but I know it's a bit confusing. Anyway, the City of London is one of the biggest financial centres of the United Kingdom, and over its history has also been the head of the serpent that was once the British Empire. But I'm not going to delve too much into the history of the City of London, but I do kind of have a history adjacent video, which covers some of the area, and this is my Bethlehem video. But for a more detailed history of the area, check out one of the many fascinating videos from Jules Guides. Right, so let's laser focus in on 20 Fenchurch Street, laser being the rather apt word. Our story begins with the end of the original 20 Fenchurch Street building. This was the 1960s glass, steel and concrete building penned by William H. Rogers and occupied by investment banking company Kleinworth Benson. The building was pretty typical for a 60s office block, but then limitations in building design and common practices meant that a high rise had to be built on a large low rise base, in which a narrower taller building could be built. This makes sense in order to ensure you have a building with a stable base, but as architectural methodology advanced and construction methods evolved, more efficient use of a plot of land could be achieved. This, coupled with the very expensive nature of land within the square mile, meant that a new, more efficient space use building could be envisioned for 20 Fenchurch Street. Thus, the old boxy building was planned for its demolition, to be replaced by a taller and wider, and some would say, more controversial skyscraper. A new tower. The building was penned by architect Raphael Benoli. It was to be a 160 metre tall building spanning 37 floors plus three sky garden floors on the top. The facade of the tower was a wall of glass over a steel and concrete skeleton, interestingly, and this would later become part of its detractors' biggest criticisms, was that the upper floors of the tower had a greater square footage than the lower floors, a complete opposite to the building that it replaced. This had two benefits. It made the tower have a more unique silhouette on its exterior, but more vital for the building's owners, Land Securities Group. It allowed the more traditionally higher and more expensive floors to be bigger, thus potentially increasing rental earnings. This would be the Achilles heel of the building, but we'll come back to that later on in the video. The building on its southern side had a concave glass facade, making the building look as if, as I've heard being described, as a pint of beer with too much foam in the head. More commonly, the building was called by locals and the media the walkie-talkie building. 
So Vinoli penned the building in 2004, and after the usual toing and froing between planners and developers, the final design was signed off by the City of London in 2007. By 2008, the original building had been demolished, and the fittings for the new tower were being driven into the London clay. However, during its construction, the building began its history of racking up controversies. As it took shape over the London skyline, many of the neighbouring properties complained over the now looming structure. One such was the obstruction of light. However, their complaints would be somewhat quelled when the structure's glass outer skin was installed, but for probably all the wrong reasons. The Fry Scraper During the summer of 2013, the building was nearing its completion. Much of the glass had been installed over the southern face of the tower, which had gained the name the Walkie Talkie Building. However, people started noticing that the streets along the East Cheap Road, at certain points of the day during the summer, it was unusually bright and hot. It is the 29th of August, and a Mr. Lindsay, director of tiling company Moderna Contracts Limited, has parked his Jaguar on East Cheap. The walkie talkie building looms over. All seem normal when he locks up his car and leaves for his business. But just two hours later, upon his return to East Cheap, he finds a crowd gathered around where his car was parked. Upon reaching the car, as reported in an interview with Lindsay by the BBC, a photographer asked me, have you seen that car? The owner won't be happy. Parts of the Jaguar had melted, painted peeled, and one of the wing mirrors had fallen apart from the heat. A note was placed on the car's windscreen from the building's contractors, asking the owner to call them. Over the following days, local businesses along East Cheap noticed burnt floor mats, wilting paintwork on shop fronts, and even merchandise in windows melting. Something was clearly not right, and the developers knew it. Over the weekend, leading into September 2013, a statement was released. We are aware of the concerns regarding the light reflecting from 20 Fenchurch Street, and we're looking into the matter. The City of London suspended parking along three bays on East Cheap, where the temperatures were deemed to be the hottest. It wouldn't take long before the city's news agencies caught on to the story that the new addition to the London skyline was potentially responsible for becoming London's first death ray. Soon enough, news crews would film their reporters frying eggs along East Cheap. It was found that temperatures would be at their hottest for roughly two hours each day in the summer at close to 90 degrees centigrade. Unsurprisingly, in typical British media fare, the building gained a few new humorous nicknames. The Fry Scraper, the Walkie Talkie, or my personal favourite, the Death Ray. The owners of the tower quickly accepted responsibility. Mr Lindsay recovered the some £900 quoted for repairs to his car, alongside the other shops along East Cheap. Eventually, developers would set up their plan to temporarily and then permanently fix the issue. Initially, a temporary screen was erected along East Cheap, which would absorb the focus sun rays. To permanently sort the issue, a non-reflective film was installed over the glass, and a Brizzy Sueli, I think I pronounced that wrong, was placed to absorb the sun. Basically, a type of parasol, which ultimately would make the building safe for its neighbours. But what many were asking was how was the building built in such a way that it allowed it to be a solar ray gun. How? So, in its most basic explanation, the design of the southern side of 20 Fenchurch Street was essentially a giant magnifying glass. The south facade was concave and highly reflective. Now, reflective glass on skyscrapers is rather common. It helps with cooling the building as it stops the sun's rays from heating up its interior. But when combined with the walkie-talkie shape, the reflected sunlight was then focused down to the ground on the southern side of East Cheap, and it created a kind of parabolic mirror. The building's architect said in an interview that the original design had louvered horizontal windows on its south facade. However, these were dropped during the planning stages between 2006 and 2008 as a cost-casting measure. The original plan would have reduced the focusing effect of the building's concave curvature, the hotspots on the ground were known by the building's planners, but it was predicted to be only around a not-so-melty 36 degrees. 
clearly these predictions were wrong, as in reality the temperature was estimated to be between 70 and 90 degrees. Although Vinoli would admit in an interview that the project had its issues, he would also put some of the blame on global warming. When I first came to London years ago, it wasn't like this. Now you have all these sunny days, so you should blame this thing on global warming too, right? A rather interesting way to blame things, I suppose. Funnily enough, architect Raphael Vinoli had actually done this before in his Vidara Hotel in Las Vegas, which had reportedly melted poolside furniture. Curved glass was also used here, and this must have been a kind of thing for the architect. Now, by 2014, the building's laser issues were solved, but that wasn't the end to the south facade's issues. So the same concave shape that caused the focus light could also focus wind which also made a sometimes very annoying wind tunnel effect along East Cheap and a pedestrian section by the south face of the tower. Now, although a rather humorous part of London's history, it was actually rather lucky that no one was killed, as the problem could have been worse if it wasn't for the generally overcast conditions London had during that summer. So that's my story on the fry scraper. It's going to be a low number on a disaster scale at a 1 or a 2. And this is what I've got for my bingo card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments. Also whilst you're there, subscribe and if you enjoyed the video and what I get up to here on my channel, maybe also give me a like. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike Licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in a currently quite dark southern corner of London UK. This is because I'm recording this at one o'clock in the morning. Anyway, I have a second YouTube channel and an Instagram as well as Twitter or X or whatever the hell you want to call it. So check them all out for my other bits and pieces. I'd like to have a very warm thank you to my Patreon and YouTube members for your financial support as well as the rest of you for watching my dodgy cartoons and listening to my poor pronunciations and slightly goofy voice. And all I have to say is thank you very much for watching. And Mr. Music, can you play us out, please? <laughs>